Good afternoon and evening, depending on where you are in the world. Good afternoon to all of you, you gorgeous diamond beauties. So happy to have all of you with us. It is another episode of the Buddhist Biohacker Creating Conscious Content for 1111D. And I am so happy because today is our very first episode of our feature with Julie Hoyle, Living in Alignment. Welcome back, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. And I have to say the energy of it is really in intense today. Yes. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yes, I love it. And for all of you guys, I see everyone joining in, like, come on, come on and join in all, all the folks in the live. Welcome in and you can definitely use the live chat. I will be moderating the live chat while Julie is presenting. So um, questions, comments, stories, we want to hear from you while we are in the live. And if you're watching the replay later, you can certainly comment on the YouTube itself. You can also go to miwi.com, Buddhist Biohacker, and share in that forum. You can also um, comment right here on our channel once we hit a thousand subscribers. So make sure you click that subscribe button, you guys. And that is all of the logistics. But we have asked Julie because I love you so much, Julie, because you are doing so much for every single person that is connecting in here to be on once a month to really feature what you have to teach, what you have to share. And it's such an honor to have you here on a regular basis. And, and there's already been so much that you've brought to the show, but I'm actually gonna hand it off to you. I'm gonna stay on the camera, but I'm gonna um, put you up so you can speak and present. And I'll be checking in in the live. I see more folks joining in. So um, I'll be on the chat as well. So take it away, Julie, I'm gonna put you up here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Lisa. It is an absolute honor to be here and as you know I absolutely love it and I love being here I mean who knew right <laughs> when you asked me all those months how many months ago three months ago I, I thought it might be a one-off and uh and here we are um so that said again you know it's a real privilege for me to be able to share once a month and I think that we've scheduled out until December off the top of my head I think that's what's happened. Um, and the reason I chose the theme, living in alignment, what does that mean for you or what does that mean to you, uh, is because we really need to own our truth and to live from that place, each and every one of us, especially now and especially given what is happening in the world. And the thing is, is you can go on to, you know, social media, you can go onto Facebook, you can go on to Instagram, you can go all over the internet and find amazing quotes from Rumi and Hafiz and from enlightened masters and great yogis. And, you know, it's just wonderful to read the content and to really feel the resonance inside yourself and to get a little boost from it and to be able to sometimes find direction and clarity in your life. Um, but then it's kind of easy to forget that and feel like somehow you have separated away from it or you've lost it. And that was certainly true in my case. And I think it's true for a lot of people who've been on a spiritual path for a long time and have been doing the work for a long time. So I want to, st I'm gonna start off with this this uh, session today right off the bat <laughs> telling you that you are already it self source god whatever you want term you want to give to that which the yogis say can never be defined that's why they refer to it as self or it or that so i'm here to prove that you are already it and i'm going to give you some evidence of it and how that's shown up in your life so i'd like you to bear with me um, in the, the this beginning part um, because what i'm going to do is give you a little test yes <laughs> i'm ready <laughs> 
also, before we get started, don't get too stressed. Oh my gosh, you know, I, I mean, I was never good at taking tests as a, as a kid and certainly through high school and, you know, through college and all of that, because I'd study like mad and then everything would fall out my head. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I can promise you, you will do very well in this test and you can award yourself and, you know, check yourself, um, mark yourself, however you want to put it. Um, each question I'm going to pose to you is out of 10 and you can give yourself kind of a mental tick and a, and a number with respect to the response that comes up for you. So the first question I have for you, which is very difficult, <laughs> is have you ever throughout your life, have you ever had an insight about your life or about a relationship or a situation of any description that has shown you and revealed to you a deeper understanding about that situation or that event or that person or with respect to yourself. Yes? I'm sure everybody's sitting there nodding saying yes and I would guess that you have had insights consistently throughout your life since you were a kid. And you have several across a week or even you know, a number during the, the day, even if it's a small insight, those insights have been happening consistently for you throughout your life. So if you've had even one, give yourself 10. All right, the second question I have for you is have you ever, throughout your life ever had an intuition about something? You know, uh, this kind of idea or this opening up that happens where you see a new possibility or a new pathway or a new opportunity in your life that you may not have seen before. Has that ever happened to you? Once, twice, a few times, three or four times throughout your life. Again, I'm guessing that everybody who's listening in on the live or listens later has had that happen to them many times, many, many, many times. So if that's true for you, give yourself a tick and give yourself 10 marks. <laughs> the third one, have you ever had an epiphany? You know, I think in terms of an epiphany as being this kind of a bigger opening somehow, this, movement that creates a shift inside of you. It reveals something and it creates a shift at the same time. And it can be pretty dramatic and pretty big, but there's a kind of, there's an energy behind it that rises up and, and, and almost returns to you as well. I think it feels like with this epiphany. And again, I'm absolutely certain that this has happened to just about every single person that is listening in today. And that you can all speak about your own epiphanies. I could write books <laughs> about epiphanies and all these things you've spoken about, but I don't want to take up time with that because it's true for each and every one of you. And I know it's true for each and every one of you. The next thing I want you to consider is, have you ever had a very deep, knowing about someone or something. You've never read it before. You've never heard it before. It just is this really deep knowing or a deep knowing about a, a world event that's going to happen or a shift that's going to happen or something that's going to show up that's never been seen before. And again, or a deep knowing about your life, actually, that's another one. You know, and you, like I always knew, I'll give you an example from my own life. I always knew when I was a kid that I wanted to be a teacher and nothing would deter me from that. Even when my father said, oh, you'll never make any money as a teacher. <laughs> but there was this just deep knowing that that was my path and that was what I absolutely had to do. I had, it was like, it was almost like I had no choice. So if that's true for you, again, give yourself 10 marks and a tick. And I'm sure it is true for you. 
So uh, another, a, a great test. I'm getting all sorts of marks. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's easy, right? <laughs> all right, another one. Here's, here's a good one. Have you ever had a breakthrough where you've been really challenged by something and it just sometimes is exhausting and you try to figure it out in your head and, and then you just kind of let it be and then somehow there's this breakthrough of awareness. It's like a light bulb goes off and you see a way through, or you see how to resolve the situation. And it just shows up without you really even looking for it, it just happens. Again, I'm pretty sure every person listening in right now has had that happen to them multiple times on many occasions, all the time, actually probably since you were kids, it's, it's a constant. Again, so give yourself a tick, give yourself 10 out of 10, or I mean, if you want to give yourself, I don't know how many points, but uh, another one. Have you ever had an empathic understanding or an awareness of someone's situation or why the way someone is or the way they're behaving? There's this kind of, even if they don't necessarily speak about you know what their pain is or what where they need healing this there's, there's there's some empathic understanding inside of you that sees clearly what this person needs help with or how you can create space for that person to support him or her or you know it could be a family member it could be a co-worker you know it could be anyone that you meet but you just have this empathy and deep understanding about how to accommodate create space and sometimes even help that person to get clear and to, to heal again I'm sure it's happened many many times with everyone listening again if it has happened at least once give yourself a tick and give yourself a mark of 10 out of 10. Uh, another one have any of you ever had a lucid dream even if you're only kind of a little bit kind of awake or it only lasts for a few seconds or something like that, have you ever had a lucid dream or a dream that has a very potent and powerful message for you that really informs your life and points to uh, something to focus on or a way to work through an issue or to, you know, improve aspects of your life or, or whatever the story is around the meaning behind the dream. And again, if you're not a lucid dreamer, that's okay. I'm pretty sure that you've had dreams that have had messages and symbols and meaning behind it that really informs your life going forward. And especially when you start on your spiritual path or spiritual journey and you start meditating and reading, you know, um, different texts and studying maybe yoga or meditation then dreams do have a way of becoming more potent and more energized and more in sync with your life and with with your sort of spiritual growth and expansion so again if that's true for you give yourself a tick and uh again another mark um out of 10. another question i have for you have you ever meditated or done some contemplation and self-inquiry and again had some sort of movement or shift or vision or clear seeing or a feeling where you're connecting into source you know or you know any of those things above where you feel ex you come out of it and you're ex feeling expansive you're feeling really centered you're feeling peaceful and calm and all those wonderful things has that ever happened to you? Again, if that's true, and I'm sure it is true, give yourself a tick and give yourself 10 out of 10. Now I could go on to, you know, and, and, and generate, I don't know, hundreds of examples here, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that every single person who's listening in right now or watching later, has can say yes check yes 10 out of 10 yes check 10 out of 10 
and so on and so forth. So yep. I think, I don't know whether we've got to 100. Another one is a vision. Have you ever had a vision about anything? Have you ever had just some kind of a, almost like a flash of lightning and this understanding about a situation or about your life? Has that ever shown up? You know, like a, some sort of almost like a flash of lightning. Um, have you ever had a uh, clairaudience or, you know, clair, clair uh, vision? Have you, uh, have you ever been able to really kind of read someone energetically? Have you ever been able to say the right words to someone because you intuitively knew what he or she needed to hear from you? You know, all of these things, the reason I'm bringing all of these things up is because I'm going to ask you another question. Before and you this, do, I'm breaking in, Julie. We got some comments. So before you do, I just wanted to share. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. We've got new people joining in and please should continue to share your stories. But um, one, of, one of our comments here says, I have had these moments for most of my life. I had spent years hiding from my gifts until finally I recognized self, all caps. Fantastic. And then, Someone else wrote, I have exclamation point. So keep sharing you guys. And I just wanted to share those. And Thank you. Well, look, you know, that really proves, absolutely proves 100% what I said at the very beginning, that everyone is already it or self or awakened awareness or source or whatever term you want to give to God to universal intelligence, to the supreme self, to higher consciousness, whatever you want to call it. But you know, what happens is we're really conditioned, and I think this is particularly in the West, we're conditioned to thinking that we have to really work very, very, very hard and to do years of study and years of meditation and years of self-inquiry before we can really own or step into or live from that place of absolute alignment with self. In truth, there's only the self here. You are already that. And the thing is, is we can read that statement because great yogis have been saying that for years and years. But to live from that place of knowing is another thing entirely. So the reason I asked, you know, about all those things, about you having those experiences, is that the place from which those experiences arise out of you, even though sometimes it feels like it's coming down from the heavens or something, that it actually comes out of you, your expanded state of consciousness, it reveals itself and it is speaking to you in language that you're able to hear and receive and recognize. And another way of proving the truth of this is that whenever you read, and I, I touched on this before in some other presentations, but it's really worth speaking to again, Whenever you read any sacred texts, yogic texts, or the Bible, or the Bhagavad Gita, or whenever you read the words of Muji, or Gangaji, or Eckhart Tolle, or any, you know, more kind of recent um, enlightened masters and teachers, and there's a resonance, we can, you know, you can sometimes read words, or the poetry of Hafiz or Rumi, you read a few lines and it's just, you just, oh, the energy of it is incredible. You feel it. You know you are seeing truth because there's absolute recognition that what you are reading is absolute truth. There's no question for doubt. You feel it in your heart space. You feel it in your energy field. It, it just completely almost, uh, I want to say consumes you, but it's, it's almost like the words on the page, what you're feeling inside and the space, seeming space between are one and the same. So this is really important because what we recognize in a teacher or a guru or a master is 
coming from that space inside of us, source itself, and essentially source itself that is here, which is you, is recognizing the embodiment of source in this guru or master or teacher that is presenting him or herself to you or in the words of the master that you're reading. Now I'm going to give you one example from my own life, which is when um, I first laid eyes on Bhagavan Nityananda in the lucid dream I had with him in 1989. I'd never read about him before. I'd never seen him before. And as soon as I saw him in this dream, I absolutely knew without question that he was God, a God realized being, and he was a form of God. And everything just fell down in acknowledgement of that. It's the only way I can put it. It's really hard to put it into words actually, but, but everything inside of me just bowed down completely because there was absolute recognition that he was a form of God. And, and that was it. It was very simple from my perspective that that was it even though no words were spoken i knew nothing about shaktipat awakening it, this was just a lucid dream i didn't even know i was a seeker as such <laughs> but there was this absolute recognition and it's taken me until fairly recently i guess f maybe five six years ago to actually wake up to the realization that that in me which recognized God or source in him is the same self. It was the same. He is the embodiment of my very own self. And, you know, this is really, really worth, for, for everybody listening, really worth contemplating, you know, and looking in the, at that and looking at ways to really start to honor that and bow down to the recognition of that and a very simple way of, of, of actually contemplating th this truth this absolute truth is by looking at those beings who have shown up in your life that you really revere and honor as being at, you know on a very high like pinnacle the highest pinnacle with respect to being enlightened, being uh, an authentic master or an authentic guru. You know, and for example, Lisa, I know that you love and adore His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So again, there's something in you, the minute you saw him and you started reading his teachings or following his teachings, there was something in you that spoke so loudly to the resonance and the recognition of what he stood for, not just with respect to, um, you know, what you were feeling inside, but also his lineage, mm -hmm. the, 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 the people, the masters that had gone before him. So you're, so you're actually bowing down to the entire lineage with respect to his holiness and all the teachings that he's given. And, and, and the thing is, what bowed down to you, what saw the greatness in his holiness, is the same self. So source was bowing down to source, or self was bowing down to self, because only the self can see itself, or only, the, only source can see and recognize source. The mind can't because the mind will always come up with reasons and doubts and questions and start being, you know, distracted and looking at always wearing funny shoes or, oh, what's his, he's got a ring on his thing. You know, it's, it's all of that nonsense that goes on with the mind. But when you're in your heart and when you're listening and in that space and you're sitting in that space, then you're in the heart of the great heart or the supreme self, or supreme consciousness, or whatever term you want to give to that, which is formless. Mm. Well, and it's what you're saying is 
So important. And I've been giving a lot of thought to this because I realize we've had discussions on other podcasts about, you know, saying yes and following the golden thread and, you know, all these things. And I think that this is the unlock for taking action in your life and saying yes to spirit is the minute you realize that is you. Yes. That, that has been the moments and is the driver for me now Mm -hmm. to do what I was called to do. I think it's so easy for us to say, oh, well, I really can't do that. Or, oh, well, that's not realistic. Or, oh, well, I'm not ready to do that. There's all these excuses we give to not do what we came here to do. And the minute that you actually look and understand in a real way, I am that. Yes. Is when you say yes, because you know, you're fully supported. Exactly. Exactly. And everything, all the help you need will show up when it, when you need it. It's very simple. You know, and the, the other thing that happens as well with a lot of people, and it, it's one of the stumbling blocks, I think, when especially with people who've been on a spiritual path for a long time, they often think that because one day they're feeling pretty crappy, for want of a better term, <laughs> you know, or, you know, frustrated about something or anxious about something or irritated or upset or not clear you know, they think that they've kind of lost their way and they've lost the self and they're not in the self anymore and they have to find a way to get back to the self and then they beat themselves up saying, you know, I should have done better. And, you know, and that is such nonsense. It's really, it, it's such an obstacle because the thing is, is that, of course, all of those movements in terms of uh, moods and feelings and you know physical ailments and problems at work or issues in relationships that th- this kind of the story or the movement of what happens in the world is always still going to do its thing it's part and parcel of being human um, we deal with that the best way we can. And of course, this, the mind still sometimes, you know, there's lots of thoughts and sometimes there aren't lots of thoughts. But, but the thing is, is that what is here prior to the story and prior to moods and feelings never comes and goes. It's always here. The self never, never moves. Absolute awareness doesn't come and go. It is always stable it is the only stable thing in the entire universe but what happens is our attention moves our attention you know it's like the ego will call or come look at this you know you go over here and so what happens is we get distracted we we move away in terms of the person the personal motivation moves away but source or self is always constant it is always here and it does not come and go. And this is the big, um, kind of the big secret in a way, if you like. Once we wake up and start doing work, work on ourselves, and especially with the shadow work, because if you haven't dealt with the shadow, you'll always feel separated and you'll always be looking for distraction and you'll never be comfortable coming back to yourself and being with yourself. Because when you're being true to yourself, then you know, there might be there might be kind of uh, irritable moods that come up, but they don't last very long because you've dealt with the shadow, you've done the shadow work. But you know, the truth is that the self is always constant. It is always here, or source, or absolute awareness, whatever you want to call it. And thou art that. You are that. That is who you are. That is your true nature and that never changes and will never change and has been true since you were born and it will be true when the body falls away and you you merge um and maybe depending on your belief system you come back or you don't come back however that works in terms of what your beliefs are but the 
that the, the truth is thou art that, you are that. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's really incredible when you start to actually own that truth and see the truth of it for yourself throughout your life because there's been evidence of it. You don't have to take my word for it. Just look at your own life and see how many times proof of the Supreme Self or absolute awareness has proven itself to you. But the key is how, how have you valued it? What value have you placed on it? How much do you want to nurture it and to own it and to be with it and to live it? rather than allowing yourself to, to be distracted and you know, go off on all these different tangents or think, you know, and this again is another one, oh, I really need to do another yoga you know, meditation retreat, or I need to read these 10 books, or I have to work on my inner child, or you know, whatever the story is. You know, and all of those things are great. They really are, they have value, they have place, it's good, it's part of the spiritual journey. But at a certain point, and I'm speaking to people that have been on a spiritual journey for a long time. And, and what happens is the people I tend to work with are the people that are in that place. They've done a lot of studying. They've done a lot of retreats. They've done some work here and there. And it's almost like, you know, when is something going to happen? You know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> When is this going to end? Yes, I know what you mean. We have another comment here. Um, Angela says, 11 years ago visiting Colorado, I heard there is someone you will meet in Colorado who will be important for you to know. I was led to Lisa's site and friendship ensued leading to Julie, my return to the self. So thank you, Angela, for sharing that for both of us. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and this is the magic and the mystery of it. And, you know, what happens is the self, universal consciousness, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, sometimes I struggle with the language of it, but let's call it the mystery, will lead us to meet whoever we need to meet in order for us to wake up essentially and realize I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, you know, and then you kind of start to. See, you, you start to live in a space of being the witness, if you like, and, you know, see things differently. And you can do that for a long time, actually. You know, some people just stay there and don't move from that place. Um, and a lot of people, and again, I think I've talked about this before, and a lot of people stay there. And they, they, they almost become a little bit of a, a bit aloof and detached. And we sometimes see this with yogis and people that almost pride themselves on having a very strong meditation practice and a yoga practice and so on and so forth. But sometimes, and obviously it's not everybody, but sometimes it's not that fully grounded and it doesn't contain their own humanness and humanity. And the thing is, is that to really fully awaken to the self, everything has to be included and we have to do the work on the shadow. And we find the middle point, the middle place. We embrace our light. We embrace our darkness. And then we realize, we realize that there is something prior to, you know, thoughts and moods and feelings, which is absolute awareness itself. And it does not come and go. Um, and that is, the, that is the gift of doing the work essentially and being committed to you know whatever whatever practices we're drawn to um, but at a certain point the weight of the practices become almost unbearable and we have to put them down and stay where we are and start to own who we are and to live from that place and you know again the evidence of it for you Lisa is that you stopped, you know, running and, you know, doing all the things that you've been doing for all these years, essentially, and you've brought it all back home to share on this platform. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of even the words, but yeah, you get to a point where, wow, I'm really struggling for words. I just think you get to a point where it becomes clear. The vision is clear. And I think it's because of, of what you're saying, you become, you know, crystallized into yourself and you suddenly I think you said something in another presentation that really struck me which is when you were reading the books and no matter what book you read it's like the same information and and you look at it and you're like okay well I know that I know that I know that and you know it's interesting because you talk about you you you're title if we want to identify anything is an awakenings activator and that's huge because gallup strength finders has 33 strengths that they identified were in all executives all ceos all entrepreneurs you can get the book strength finders and take the test and one of those 33 strengths is activator and when I took that test in fashion retail uh, 15, maybe 20 years ago now, Activator was at the bottom of my list. It was actually one of my least strengths. And my strengths was visionary and strategic. And, you know, I had the vision and I couldn't activate it. And so that word Activator is really up for me today because of what you're talking about, which is, once I did that work on the shadow, once I moved through that energy, once I put those books down, it, it allowed me to become an activator. It allowed me to do the work I was envisioning for so long and put it into reality. And a big part of that is what you're saying about being human. Yes. You know, we came to the planet and I think I spent so much time and we all do it. We spend this whole time like I want to astral travel and I want to go to the ethers and I want to see stuff and have visions. And we forget that like this is the vision and this is the dream and this is the experience. And so I think that's really that activator energy comes from the integration. Mm hmm. Yes. Well, yeah, you know, the thing is, is that kind of whole title was just it just came up it was given to me by Nityananda actually last week or the week before and I was like hmm this is interesting <laughs> but you know I'm seeing the thing is is I'm seeing evidence of it because what's happening is is I'm getting emails from people who have seen some of the presentations and who have clearly received Shaktipat from what has been shared I can't take any credit for that that comes through the lineage of the yogis that first initiated me through Bhagavan Nityananda so, but but you know essentially really you know at the end of the day it doesn't matter so much what our lineage is or which who we resonate with in terms of the the one that activates us and brings us into this awareness obviously we honor them very much because they change our lives and at the end of the day the, the the evidence shows through in terms of our lives what we're called to and how willing we are to step into it and to speak and be and act and share from that place and this is true for everyone that's listening in there's something that has called you to be here today and obviously to do your own work and the work that you've been doing up to this point and you know one of the questions I did want to pose this afternoon is how long are you going to keep seeking when are you going to get to a point where you say enough and you're well ready to put everything down and stay with yourself, be with, you, with yourself, especially with respect to whatever might be coming up that is difficult to look at. Because oftentimes the reason that we keep going on a spiritual path and wanting to do all the practices is a form of escapism. 
And that can be the whole sort of spiritual striving it becomes an obstacle in and of itself. And everyone at a certain point is called to put that down, to leave it alone. And obviously there's value in all of that too. Uh, we learn how to meditate, we learn how to do self-inquiry and all those things. But at a certain point, you'll have to put everything down and be with yourself and recognize yourself and recognize what it is in you that has been able to recognize the self in the great beings and the masters that you've studied with. And that realization, that is what is key. And one of the, a, a very simple quote that I really, or a little story actually, that I really love, um, which I think I, I quoted in the lesson I sent out, the Living in Alignment lesson I sent out last month. But um, there's a story about a seeker who went to Ramana Maharshi and he ran into the hall. He was just so intent because he was really been meditating and doing yoga for years and he was just frustrated as heck. So he ran into the hall and he shouted, show me God, show me God, I want you to show me God. And Ramana Maharshi said, my dear sir, that is impossible. The place from which you are seeing is God. That's so beautiful. And that's the truth. That is the truth. You know, and how, why is it, or how is it that it, things are set up this way? You know, we wake up, we have this awakening experience, then we go on this kind of journey, we're looking here, we're looking there, we're picking up all these sort of tools and practices, we get our big, you know, bag full of <laughs> all these ideas and, you know, again, <laughs> books and things and chimes and bells and whatever we have going on um, as a way of trying to find truth without realizing that the place we're looking from, the place we're seeking from is the self, is God. I have a question for you that just kind of popped in my head. We're talking about seeking. We've got some great comments too. Somebody wrote, uh, Jen wrote, uh, wow, that makes so much sense to me. Time to set things down, just be, the time is now. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for continuing to share your comments. But I had a question, you know, we're talking about putting everything down. What is it like for you, Julie? when you meditate or practice yoga or read a book now, after you put everything down, how does that, how is it different, you think? Um, it's very different. Um, so let me just preface first what, that, what it was like ahead of the clear seeing. I, and I think I shared some of this before, but you know, for years and years and years, I had a very rigorous, practice where I would get up at 4.30 in the morning or something like that. And I would chant the Guru Gita, which is a long chant. It's takes, it's, there's 181 verses and it would take an hour and a half to chant. And then I'd meditate um, and often do some Hatha yoga. And then I'd go for a walk and then I'd get ready for work. I'd go out, so, yeah, so I'd get up at like 4.30 in the morning or something. And then I'd leave just before eight to go and do a, a day's work. And then the whole day I'd be repeating the mantra that I'd be given, Om Namah Shivaya. That went on for you. I think I did that consistently every day for, with the Guru Gita for eight or nine years, maybe 10 years or something like that. And then I've had, I'd have, I had a meditation practice that for a lot longer close to 30 years. <clears throat> so, and I'd done the Guru Gita on and off, but I hadn't been as, I mean, I wouldn't go a day without doing the Guru Gita. Um, so, you know, I'm very strict in terms of my diet, vegetarian diet, and it's just very strict. What I would watch on television, what I'd read, all of those things are very, very, very strict. Um, and then after this, what, what happened then was I started to feel that 
there was a certain weight in the practices and there was just this and then I think I shared this as well that I saw you know I did some counseling with some people that had been involved you know in on the spiritual journey for 30 40 sometimes 50 I mean a long time and was still in the same place and I just started having these epiphanies and thinking, oh my gosh, look at this. I, you know, I just, this, this doesn't, this isn't going to work. I don't want to be on my deathbed, you know. And, um, you know, and I'm just, sorry for going on, but I'm just trying to kind of give you the context here. So, uh, you know, so that happened and then it started to feel like there was weight and then I just dropped everything. I just literally just dropped everything. Um, and what had been happening for some time was I'd been having a feeling to go, into the silence within my own being that was the primary practice so i'm telling you that to say this the seated formal meditation practice ended because i was meditating during the day every day i was in the silence so i was in that space of meditation no matter what i was doing even when, there, even when I was teaching or sharing, I didn't move from self. Um, and then what happened is that I had this, this huge kind of seeing, I guess is how, how you'd call it, what you call it. Um, and the self sat up and saw itself fully. There'd been moments before, but this was an absolute, this is a movement of self that was um, undeniable. And then from that point on, it never left. It didn't go. So I still do, I still do some Hatha yoga, which I really enjoy. I actually love, I have to say, I love your class. I did, I've done your class, I don't know how many times. Oh, you know. thank you. While it was up on the, um, you know, on the, the for, for the first retreat, I also did satyams. Mm. Uh, Tony and I did that a lot. Three, I mean, I think maybe five or six times or something because I love the way he presents. Yeah, satyam is, is such a light, and he's actually on tomorrow, you guys. He's on at, at three o'clock. Yeah, he's really wonderful. Yeah, so I just loved his style. You know, I like kind of like very kind of laid back kind of teaching. Um, so I still do Hatha yoga. And then I'll meditate whenever I get a, you know, if there's space in the day or I have a feeling to meditate, I'll just sit down. Or, you know, I, it, it, but the thing is, is it's continuous. I don't know how else to say it. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, it has changed dramatically. And, um, it's it's who I am, mm -hmm. and so so the practices. I, I guess the the value of doing the small formal practices show up in my day to day life in a way that's effortless. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah. We got a question here. I just want to throw. I mean, I think it's kind of what you just answered, but I'm going to read it anyway. So. Uh, Raquel's question is, how do you know if you're doing the practices out of enjoyment versus seeking? I don't have a rig rigorous practice. I know that I have been seeking and seeking, but some of the things I do, I just enjoy. I enjoy meditating, reading books, chanting, but I don't have a strict practice. So her question is, how do you know if you're doing them out of enjoyment versus seeking? Well, I think when you're doing it out of seeking, there's a drive and sometimes it's tedious and there's a heaviness to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I would, you know, stay with the enjoyment. If you're enjoying the practices, then definitely stay with them. Um, you know, and it might be that you just continue with them and that's perfectly fine too. I can only speak from my own direct experience, which is that they started to have weight mm -hmm. and I just felt like I just couldn't bear the weight of it anymore. And, and what it was, was I had this, this epiphany that I couldn't bear the weight of the lie. Mm. And I remember this is like, I couldn't bear the weight of the lie. And then I was contemplating what that meant. And what I realized was the weight of the lie was that 
there was there was this this belief that I was a seeker and I was on this path doing the practices in the hope that I would attain something next week, next year, 10 years from now, whenever, right? It's always in the future. And the lie, the lie of that is that none of that was true because I'm already that. I have always been that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the lie is that I'm not the person. I am the supreme self. I am the ab- absolute awareness itself. And this, uh, another way of looking at it is this kind of this two aspects, if you like, of, of our lives. One is that I am the formless self. The, fo- the self is formless, right? Or absolute awareness is formless. And coming out of that formlessness is form. Or the physical form, the ex- physical expression. So we're both, we're both formless and we're form. Mm. You know, it, I hope it's okay for me to share. I, um, for me, I had a similar experience with diet um, through my health journey. Um, my diet was incredibly disciplined, as you know, Julie. Yeah. And how I managed my diet was disciplined. And I don't even know, I don't really talk about this, but since 2011, I actually play chanting when I cook. I chant when I cook, I chant when I'm grocery shopping. Um, I play music and just go through, you know, all of the mantras and every time I'm cooking things and it's always very disciplined and where does the food come from and what am I eating and what am I ingesting? It's an incredibly disciplined process. And Last year, and I I truly believe this is what led me to Ayurveda, and I'm just sharing because I think this experience gives another same same thing, but different example, Mm -hmm. but is that same thing. It got heavy. It it became a chore to do those practices, to be disciplined with what I was eating, to manage every single little detail, to practice all of the chanting. All of these things became very heavy that weight you're talking about and um it was probably beginning of last year I thought you know what I don't think like I didn't eat any sugar or carbs for years and years and years and last year it I just let it all go I said you know what I don't think this is working for me anymore it Mm -hmm. feels heavy and rigorous and not serving me and my health wasn't actually thriving from it Mm-hmm. And it led me to Ayurveda, it led me to a different journey of, wow, I might actually be able to eat some rice and some beans and it might be okay. And actually it's leading me out of the paleo meat journey and into a more of a vegetarian journey. Um, but it's that same thing. Like when you're talking, I'm thinking that for me, it hasn't been the books or the yoga, but it was the diet piece of letting that go and allowing my intuition. And what's funny is when I cook, I'm still chanting and it's still, but it's like this flow that's coming through me and something that I love and it makes me smile. And my little girls think it's hilarious because I'm always singing and my littlest will sing too. And so we'll sit and we'll sing and we'll cook, but it's like fun. It's not that heavy, like I have to do this. I have to make sure my body is exactly the right way. Like it's this relaxed and it's, it's opened me back up to new vegetables and fruits and things I wasn't even seeing. And so anyway, I just wanted to share, because I think that's another example of how you put that heaviness down and allow the expansion. Yes, it's, and and it's absolutely true. I, I think I may have shared this before, but um, when, when Tony and I were living at the ashram in India, we lost, we both lost so much weight. I mean, it wasn't even funny. You know, at the best, I, I'm around 110 or 112 pounds. I weigh nothing. And we went there and, <clears throat> excuse me, I kept getting amoebas. You know, even though everything was triple washed and, you know, everything was very hygienic um I would just get these amoebas all the time and couldn't you know I think that I got rid of them and then it would just flare up again and then you're just running to the loo every five seconds 
And um, so I got really ill. And then I had a bout of shingles on my face that tracked all the way through and then through my eye and everything. So there's a lot of messages in all of that. But the thing is, the reason I'm telling you all of that is that one weekend, I was just kind of getting over the worst of it. And one weekend, Tony and I were going into Mumbai. We used to have a, I'd be able to have a, a day off and get to go into Mumbai to do shopping or whatever. And we went to the Taj Mahal Hotel, which is beautiful, beautiful hotel in, in Mumbai. And I sat down to have lunch and I would always have vegetarian. I mean, I've been a vegetarian on and off since I was at 14 or something. I mean, for years, years and years. And I looked at the menu and I said to Tony, he said, what, what do you want? I said, I'm gonna have some salmon. I have to eat salmon. And he was just so stunned, he couldn't believe it. And I just said, my body needs to eat some salmon. And so from that point on, uh, I started to introduce fish into my diet and um, I've, I've eaten fish ever since. Because I was really, you know, being true, paying attention to what my body was needing. And, you know, rather than, which is what you're speaking to, being really rigorous and tight, and you know, almost kind of rigid about everything that that isn't very helpful at all. And the same is true, you know, whether it's your spiritual practices, your physical health, you know, what you're eating, what your environment is like, you know, all those things we really have to be very um, respectful towards, because that is part and parcel of us taking care of our form. You know, and the, again, the yogis say you reach the formless through the form. So the taking care of the form is really important if you want to connect in with that which is formless, which is your true nature. You know, and everything's taken into consideration. And that's the beauty of it. You know, and that, that might include maybe having a glass of champagne once in a while. You know, because that's the other thing that comes up for people. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to become enlightened. I'm not going to drink. And I was certainly like that for years and years and years and years and years and years, and years, and years believe me. <laughs> I was so rigid about everything. Or, you know, you, you shouldn't drink coffee or, you know, whatever the story we tell ourselves. It, it, it just can sometimes get ridiculous. Yeah. And then, we're, you know, we're no fun to be with. We're just a, kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> because no, <laughs> Well, and it's funny you say that because His Holiness, I just love this story and I love it more because we have digital proof now after last week, but His Holiness, I told my husband the story too, and then he told the exact story on the Avalo Kitcheshvara Empowerment. So you guys can go to the Dalai Lama .com, watch the Avalo Kitcheshvara Empowerments. You must anyways, they're amazing, but he tells this exact story, which was, he said, you know, the vow, there's a vow in Vajrayana Tantra, where you don't do drugs or drink. And His Holiness said in 2011 at the Kala Chakra, the exact same story he just told, which is um, don't do drugs. But he said, if you're going to drink, he said, I'm gonna tell you what my teacher told me, which is just a little, don't lose consciousness. You know, yeah. stay in consciousness, but have just a little. and. He literally just told that story again, so you guys can hear it again, because the vows are taken seriously. And yet, even for the Dalai Lama to say, like, really, it's okay. He, he told us in Washington, D.C., he said, I went to the White House last night, and he's like, they offered me wine. I had some wine. He's like, I, you have to, you know, you're part of the world. And it's such a great thing to hear, like, oh, have some, you know, have some protein, have some wine, do the things intuitively your body needs, and you don't have to yes. make a straight line. Yeah, because, because it, it's, again, from the yogic tradition, they talk about, um, you know, the strings of a, of a guitar or a lute or whatever, if, if, if they're pulled too tight, they snap. If they're too loose, you can't get good sound. It, it, you have to find the middle point. So it's really about finding the middle point, living a healthy life, obviously enjoying your life because 
you know, we're not, none of us are monks. We're not living in ashrams. We're not, or convents or whatever. <laughs> we're living our lives in the world. So an occasion, and, and you know, and the thing is, is I got a strong message to speak to this today because it's really important with respect to community and family, family, you know, building family relationships and friendships and, you know, the people that you work with, co-workers and so on, to, to, to try and kind of at least be at ease within yourself so that if you are offered, you know, a little glass of wine or whatever, whatever it is, or you asked to partake in something, you don't, you know, close everything off because, you know, you take this kind of holier than thou stance and I can't do that. You know, I'm a vegetarian. I don't drink. <laughs> um, you, you know, and it, we're living in the West. We... You know, we're not living these kind of lives where we're detached from the world and we're not connecting and meeting people. So, you know, the thing is, is how do you reflect joy and authenticity and integrity and love of life if you're so far up your own rear end? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You're not enjoying any of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I'm so glad that we're talking about it and you bring it up because I feel very passionate about this and passionate that we we cannot bring the vibration of that into our world if we aren't living that through everything that we're doing here. Yes. And being honest as well, because look, here's the other thing is, if we're so tight and we're so scared, because you're coming from a place of fear, actually, is what's happening. If you think, oh, you know, I can't, I can't uh, change my diet, it has to be really strict, vegan, let's say, and I'm just pulling that out of the air, vegan, and then I can't drink any alcohol, and, you know, I can't socialize, and I can't do this and can't do that, you know, I mean... What's the point, really? You know, you, you're not even enjoying it yourself. <laughs> and people don't want to be around you. <laughs> That's so true. Well, and I think it's the, the, the master teachers and the gurus and the yogi, like any of the, the realized teachers on the planet that I think most all of us are drawn to are the ones who are most human. Yes. Exactly. It is why I love his holiness because he is very human and he will tell you that over and over again. Hilarious stories where it's only hilarious because you know he's this enlightened guru and he's like telling you how he's jealous about something or how he's mad about something or how, you know, it's like, and then he laughs about it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. And, and that's the same thing. I think even, you know, I, I didn't, all I know of Nityananda is a photo, but I can imagine that he was similar, you know, that there's this humanness to yes. who they yeah. are. Yeah, I, I mean, I know one of the things I did know about him is he used to love coffee. He used to love either black coffee or coffee with condensed milk, you know, I think it's, you know, the thick canned milk? Yeah. The really sweet one, and uh, that he used to love that. And um, would usually, always before he took food he'd make sure that people that were coming to see him had, had eaten he'd always ask them ask them have you eaten it was always about have you eaten you know have you been to the there's like there was like a sulfur baths you know where people would go and bathe you mm -hmm. know have you been there have you you know and it was always about taking care of their humanity and taking care of their physical well-being and making sure they were comfortable and, and this, is, this is consistent with any authentic master or teacher that I've ever had contact with. It's, the, the, the questions are always around the person's physical well-being. Mm. Because the thing is, is that you can't really meditate and do the practices if you're not taken care of in terms of your physicality. For example, if you're starving, you know, you're not going to be thinking about meditating. <laughs> 
That's true. Well, and Iyengar says in Light on Life, he he says if you're if your physical well-being, if you're not vibrant and flexible and healthy and strong, don't even think about meditating. He's like, go take care of your body first. And it's so true. And it's funny because I'm just sitting here thinking about what you're saying about coffee. And I think every time I have someone for an Ayurvedic consultation, that's like the first thing they say is I'm not going to be vegetarian. I can't give up coffee. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like we didn't even talk about it. Like there is this kind of weird thought about that. And I think it's the middle way, right? Like it's, you don't have to give everything up. It's better if you find a balance. Yeah, and that's really important. You know, when I, I went for a, an Ayurvedic consultation when we were in Mumbai, in, at the ashram, we went to Mumbai and this very well-known um, Dr. Pankaj, his name is, and he actually used to be the consultant for, for His Holiness. Oh. And there were photos of His Holiness all over the office. <laughs> and he, His Holiness used to go there for at least once or two, one week or two weeks a year and he'd have his special place there and Dr. Pankaj would treat him and he would do his diet for him and all of that. Um, and the thing is, the thing that was fascinating is that um, Dr. Pankaj takes pulse diagnosis at the tip of the fingers and then on the wrist points. Yeah. And uh, the first thing he said to me was that, um, that I was very hungry. I was, I hadn't eaten anything hardly. And we'd been waiting quite a bit in the waiting room. So it was, it was kind of past lunchtime. But anyway, and he said, I had a headache. I had a propensity for leaving, being outside my body all the time, which is true. <laughs> and then he pointed to, he was speaking specifically about some problems I had in my spine L, at the L4 and L5, um, um, what do you call it? things in his mind anyway um so anyway he's been very specific but then he went on to speak about diet and again like you said it was very practical down to earth you're talking about eating bread and make sure if I eat bread I toast it and, you know it's really very 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 practical it wasn't saying you know you should give up this and you should give up that it was really absolutely suitable for where I was and what was happening in my life and how to take care of my physicality hmm. and you know and all of these things are really important because it's very very easy to get have these concepts about what a spiritual person or a realized person looks like <laughs> yes there's an idealistic vision and there's often a disappointment or a letdown if if you haven't integrated i my ayurvedic teacher said the very first class in january she said you have to be able to forgive your teacher and don't forget that and i mm -hmm. loved that she said that and i knew she was a teacher for me when she said that because it's true we're all human yeah yeah and, you know, and this is why there are so many problems with gurus and masters and yogis who they have all these ma massive followers and then the followers find out that this guru has maybe had a relationship or has been smoking or drinking or doing something that they feel is untoward. And, you know, and certainly it isn't good if that if that master or guru has taken vows of celibacy and then broken those. And I'm not advocating. I'm not here to advocate that at all. I think it's terrible. Um, but certainly for those of us that live in the West and we live a householder life, it's very different. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean that you cannot attain the self. And that is a big thing. If you know, forget everything else. <laughs> the one thing I want you to take away today is you are already the self. I am that. I am the self no matter what conditions you're finding yourself in with respect to work or relationships, you know, wealth or lack thereof, it, you're still the self. Absolutely the self. And that does not come and go. That remains. But, you know, attention goes. Attention moves back, back and forth in a way. 
So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to speak about this because I think it's really, really important, especially given this crazy time that we're living in. And my intuition, and certainly from what Nityananda has told me, is that it's time for people to, you know, stop and end the search, just call it, you know, call it done. <laughs> and start to wake up to what has always been here and to own it and to live from that place because we can't go on the way we've been going on and we're seeing evidence of that again through world events so much yeah so you know the question is are you going to end the search or are you ready to end the search or when are you going to end the search <laughs> And also, you know, another way of looking at it, what is it you're still trying to find? What do you think you haven't already got? Because so you keep, you know, you keep coming up with the same things, right? You read, you reach for another book, oh, it's the same thing. It's just written differently. Yep. It's so wonderful to have you on. I'm excited about this monthly feature. I feel like it's just so fabulous and needed and perfect. Yeah, it is. It's really, it's a really great theme. And, um, you know, it, I, I actually thought it, it might be nice to um, invite people to post questions yeah. so that we can use those questions for the next sessions and, um, and look at those. And actually, speaking of that, before I know we've, uh, it's probably time to pack up. But Raquel actually sent an email a few days ago. Let me just pull it up again. Um, asking a question. Let me just see. And I said I'd deal with it today, and I didn't want to go in. Oh, she was asking about what keeps us holding on. Mm. What keeps us from letting it all go at once? Mm. Um, she's, I mean, there were other things that she asked, but I think, I think we've kind of covered some of that content <laughs> in this session. You know, and quite honestly, that is really a good question. What does keep us hold, holding on? And I think a lot of it is just habit. And, and a lot of it as well that I've seen is that, especially people that be, have been on a spiritual path for a long time, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years or whatever, it often feels like I've invested so much time and energy in this and in this path and these practices. I can't give up now. What if it's just around the corner? It's, it's almost like there's this drive to keep that going because we don't want to give up on what we've already committed to. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really, again, that is what the obstacle is essentially. That, that idea that we have to keep looking and have to keep going and enlightenment will be next week, next month or next year, rather than what is right here, right now. Once we put an end to that drive to keep going, going, going and beating ourselves up when we feel like we haven't got it right <laughs> or we get upset. You know, I shouldn't be getting upset. Or we're irritated. I shouldn't be getting upset. <laughs> Instead of keeping it real, you know, and being honest and looking at, okay, anger's come up or irritation's come up. Okay, let me see what this is about. Let me at least meet it. What is it showing me? What is the lesson? What, where's, what is the value? Rather than trying to push it away and go and meditate, meditate it away or whatever. So it's, uh, you know, all of these things are really important if we want to live in truth and in integrity mm -hmm. and be true uh, and recognize the self. Yeah. Oh man, I'm like, you're talking and I just, oh, it makes me exhausted thinking of all the spinning that I would do. Oh, so much spinning. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look everywhere for answers and they're really just inside ourselves. And once you realize that it's, everything changes but it's getting off that hamster wheel but once you're off it's like woo yeah I know 
you know, and it might be that we do that in increments. Mm. You know, I tend to be, you know, I can be a bit dramatic, like with the shadow work. I was like, bring it on, let me do it. I want to deal with it, you know. And and it was the same with dropping everything. I just, just, just dropped everything. Just, it just almost became a bit, I was disgusted with it. I don't know how else to put it. You know what I mean? I was like, Argh! just had to put it down. <laughs> but maybe for other people, she's just, you know, a little bit at, at a time. Um, and then just once you've let everything go, mm -hmm. then just look, you know, just look and notice and be with what is here and what is showing up. Mm. Yes. And um, be honest. Just meet it. You don't have to drown in it. If there's loads of anger, it doesn't mean you have to, you're going to kind of, you know, drown in it and never be able to get out of it but at least meet it and have a conversation with it and learn from it. And then, you, you know, you, you're not so exhausted. You've got vitality returning to you. And clarity as well, clarity returns to you. And creativity returns to you and all those great things that you've often kind of been running behind or running after. Mm. So anyway, there's a lot more I could say. <laughs> yes, that's why you're here all the time. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on. And if you guys have not either signed up for one of Julie's courses, gotten her book or, or had a private session with her, please do. I have been working with Julie for more than 15 years. I think like 17 years or something since like 2006. How does that, how did that work? We I, haven't aged a day, right? <laughs> I know, right? It's true. <laughs> and it's, she is beyond amazing to work with. And you know, the, your course honoring your soul contract, that painting course has become an integral tool in my toolbox. And my spiritual entrepreneurship group, we are actually going to do your course on Sunday. So I'm going to send pictures to you. Oh, oh. We are going to do it with the intention that we are going to look at how our soul contract relates to our brand and use that in Wonderful. creating our paintings. Wonderful. And so if you guys have not signed up for that, I did it with my husband and the kids. I mean, it's just fabulous. So Julie, you want to tell everybody your email so they know how to find you and or yeah, your, sure. your website, I guess, would be the right thing to say there. So yeah. Yeah, sure. First of all, let, let me give you my email and then I'll talk about the website. But my email address is truealignment at yahoo.com. And my website is very simple juliehoyle.org and you can find me on instagram as well um julie hall true alignment uh i'm on facebook as well and uh now me we so yeah which is fun i've been really enjoying me i must say because i feel like i can be much more open and share more deeply than i can on the other platforms because obviously you know you've got a kind of a broader mix of people that aren't necessarily interested in deeper sort of processes of awakening so that has been really awesome and i've loved sharing on that but um feel free to message me or if you have questions about anything that's been covered in this session you can either email me or you know you can write questions underneath the live stream yes or message me on instagram or however you want to do it Absolutely. And you can also go to the Buddhist biohacker on MeWe. And what we are doing is we're posting, you know, about the upcoming live events. We're also posting the links to the YouTube here. So on either of those for today, you guys can write your comments and questions to I really am passionate about us building a community of light on there and on here. And so the more you share, the more we all help each other. So definitely do that and um, continue to share, spread the word about this channel because we wanna get to a thousand subscribers. It's like my passion right now, simply to get that community page. I just think 
it it's all about easefulness and i think it's easeful to go to one place and be able to communicate because once we do that we can communicate about these episodes and and special features like right on this channel which really helps all of us and allows all of the facilitators and guests to be able to connect into so and then tomorrow's podcast wednesday and we have a huge week I, it started today with you, Julie, and then tomorrow at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, we have Deanna Hansen, the founder of Block Therapy, and she is talking about her book, which is called Fascia Decompression, The Missing Link in Self-Care, and I am obsessed with fascia and the decompression of fascia, and I've been using my block, and I it's fabulous. If you're into shamanic ancestral clearing, fascia decompression should be your first go-to. And then at 11 a.m., we have Jeff Strong from the Strong Institute. He is a world-renowned drummer who is turned scientist. And he has a course, you guys, with 72 videos that's drumming with the chakras. And he actually transforms and transmutes your kundalini through drumming in this. He's created it with his wife. He'll be on tomorrow because he his new pet project is looking at how your mind changes in meditation and then how it changes in meditation with drumming and how different it is. And so that's what we're talking about tomorrow. And then at three o'clock, we have Satyam, which Julie and I talked about too. And he's going to be talking about why yoga works. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. So, and then Friday, we have Tim Sanders from Omni, who is going to talk about quantum physics. So it's kind of a crazy busy week, but really good stuff to tune into. So that's awesome. Yes, I just love it. I mean, we just have so many great people and great guests coming up. And Julie, I just can't thank you enough for being accessible to all of us and being able to take your time and energy to share all of these important nuggets of wisdom with us and teachings and and everything. So Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a joy. I love it. I love it too. And just remember you guys, Buddhist biohacker, we are creating conscious content for 1111D. We are making those radical shifts into the new reality as fast as possible. And Julie will be back. I think you're back before even your feature, but we do have our, our summit starting next week. So um, that's gonna be almost 50 hours of classes and workshops over eight days. So you can go to oneheartoneearth.net. That's oneheartoneearth.net and join our June summit. It's free to register, it's free to watch. Um, and One Heart, One Earth is launching into a nonprofit. There's more to come with that very soon. Um, and so that this summit is our launch pad for that. So thank you so much, Julie. Thank you to everybody who's watching now and for all your comments and questions. And um, let's just keep it going. Let's keep the conversation going. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Love you, Julie. Too. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye.